I believe most of us have seen beautiful scans of buildings, statues, and other art objects captured with the ray. But today I would like to begin with what this scanner actually specializes in, which is industrial scanning of large vehicles, pipelines, wind turbine blades, and various other engineering installations. Uh, all that is being scanned for the purpose of further reverse engineering or quality assurance. This does not mean that uh, people from history related domains or art industry shouldn't consider the ray scanner as uh, their instrument. In fact, even though they don't conduct quality assurance measurements, they still strive for high precision. When they plan to scan an architectural masterpiece, they don't want their model to be similar-ish to the original object. They want an exact copy, which is perfectly achievable with the ray. But uh, we see the ray as first and foremost, a high precision metrology grade instrument in the hands of uh, engineers. And with that being said, let me share some examples of how our clients have adopted the ray scanner to better meet their engineering challenges. That first challenge was faced by Asian Sealand Offshore and Marine, a company from Singapore, assisted by our gold certified partner, Shono Design, who was tasked to facilitate the reverse engineering and replacement of a damaged 15 meters vertical pipe uh, on a floating vessel. Um, so their goal was not only to scan the damaged pipe, but also to reverse engineer it so that the 3D model could be used for generating the blueprints and two-dimensional drawings needed for the production and for the replacement. One of the most complex parts of the project was accessing the pipe as it was surrounded by other pipes and uh, all the equipment was situated in a fairly small room with limited space and access. Um, to execute that project, uh, the operators opted to use a combination of two scanners. So they used the Ray and the Lear. Uh, the idea behind this was to capture the geometry of the pipe and the room itself with the Ray and use this data as an accuracy backbone for the more detailed Leo scans. So the Ray was set up uh, to, pardon, in nine different positions all across the space to capture the needed data. Uh, but when it came to the Leo scanner, uh, there were just not enough space to, uh, to walk on or to stand on with a handheld scanner. So the workers had to use the, some climbing ropes, climbing equipment to scan the obstructed areas of the pipe while literally being suspended in mid air. During post-processing, uh, the raw Leo data was aligned with these highly accurate ray scans, which effectively eliminated the error accumulation across the length of the pump. We will elaborate on this workflow combining ray data uh, and LEO data further on in the webinar. All raw data sets were then fused together into just one single model, which was then exported to Geomagic Design X, where it was reverse engineered and converted into a set of two dimensional drawings. Uh, even though the scanning project was immense, a team of just four people was able to complete it in two days without the need of shutting down the site. Uh, if you want to learn more about this project, our marketing team will publish uh, the full case study on the Artec website. So yeah, you're welcome to take a look. Um, another case that I'd like to briefly mention comes from the mining industry. Um, our Australian partner, Cubic, reported having a number of customers who use the ray scanner for a mining equipment inspection and reverse engineering. So in this picture, uh, we see a mining bucket, which is like an excavator bucket, which, but much larger and sturdier, being scanned with the ray scanner. Um, you know, since the next two sections will be devoted to accuracy and targets, let's do a quick poll related to targets. All right, so the question is, why do we use targets or spheres when scanning with the ray? It is a multiple choice question, so we can choose a few options if you like. For better accuracy, for faster alignment, use the ray without targets or spheres, 
and targets. What targets? Okay. I get a lot of answers coming in. All right, so more than a half of you have voted, so I guess we can stop the poll and share the results. All right, there you go. So um, most of all have, have answered the poll. Now you should be able to see the results on your screen. And now let's move on, move on to the section where Vadim will bring some clarity to that matter. Okay, so the next subject that we're going to tackle will take us deeper into the world of metrology, reverse engineering, and quality control. And while the ray is a very accurate instrument in itself, its accuracy can actually be assisted or verified with the help of a laser tracker, a device that looks like this. We'll see it right on the next slide. There we go. But before we dive in and explore the laser tracker assisted workflow, let's have a quick word about the ray scanner's own accuracy. When you're scanning in high quality mode at a distance of about 15 meters from the object, the ranging error is specified at 0.7 millimeters. If I oversimplify things a bit, this number is the combined error of range noise and angular accuracy which basically means that this is the highest error you will get under normal conditions of use. Now on this slide, we have a good visual representation of what the range noise and angular accuracy values actually mean. The angular accuracy is the rotational error, which accumulates when the scanner rotates. It's measured in arc seconds. The range noise on the right is the point uncertainty in terms of distance from the scanner. Now this uncertainty also depends on the material being scanned and on the high quality, high sensitivity setting. It's definitely worth mentioning that the overall error spec which we provide is fairly conservative. We have a customer in the airline industry, for example, who generally tends to measure, remeasure, check, and double check his measurements. So from the information that he provided us, the scanner is giving him a pretty stable 0.55 millimeter accuracy at a distance of 15 meters. At closer distances of around four meters, he even achieves an accuracy of 0.25 millimeters. This is because the sweet spot of the scanner, where you get the highest possible accuracy, is situated between four and six meters. Now, the material being scanned does play an important role though, and I should mention that white aircraft paint is a very easy to scan surface. Guys, can I ask you to please mute uh, microphones? Thanks. Now, another advantage of scanning at such a close range of around four to six meters is that the resolution of the scan data will actually be comparable to that of our handheld EVA scanner, and that is fantastic. Now, let's move on and return to the topic of laser trackers. So for those amongst you who have never encountered or used such a device, let me do a short introduction. The laser tracker enables you to measure the three-dimensional coordinates of a special SMR target, which you see here in the middle. And it does this with an accuracy of a few micrometers or microns over a range of tens of meters. SMR means spherically mounted reflector, by the way. This SMR target, which is kind of a complex mirror prism, is mounted into an SMR nest, also called a drift nest which you can see here on the far right of the slide. These nests are often magnetic and they can also accommodate 
a professional laser scanning checkerboard target, which you'll see on the next slide. Okay. So when combining a laser tracker and the ray scanner in your workflow, it goes something like this. We begin with step one, where a network of drift nests is attached on or around the object being scanned. And then, one by one, the nest coordinates are recorded by snapping the SMR, that mirror prism, into each nest and pointing the laser tracker at it. This results in a file with extremely accurate coordinates of the SMR nests. And depending on the quality of the equipment used, the working distances, and the care taken during the setup, the measurement accuracy of the resulting 3D coordinates constellation can vary from 10 to 100 micron. On a side note, it is worth mentioning that some customers from the automotive and aircraft industries have permanent SMR nest installations in their production facilities. So these are used for regular accuracy related checks and cross checks during manufacture and assembly of their products. And next, step two. Here, professional checkerboard targets are fitted into the same drift nests that were used for the SMR measurement earlier. It is worth noting that these targets are manufactured with an accuracy tolerance of 50 microns. The ray scanner is then set up and a scan or a number of scans are then made. If multiple scans are made, at least three matching target pairs need to be captured per each scan in order for registration to be possible later on. Another important thing to consider here is that for this workflow, we absolutely need the ray scanner's raw C3D data. If you're using the iOS or Android scanning app called Artec Remote, and this is exactly the type of data that will be saved to the scanner's micro SD card. If on the other hand, you are using Artec Studio, then you'll need to pull out this data from the Artec app data directory. If in doubt, don't worry, you can always contact our support team for more information. <clears throat> and then finally, step three. We now have two data sets at our disposal. We have the laser tracker measured constellation of SMR nests, and we have the ray 3D scan data with the checkerboard targets in that data. The combination of these two data sets is done in one of the following software applications, so Polyworks or Spatial Analyzer. You see both logos on the slide. These software packages can import both data sets and can align and register them together. While this is the most accurate registration available for laser scanners overall, it also allows you to set tolerances, uh, thereby checking whether the scan data meets the desired accuracy requirements. While this workflow may be somewhat more complex than your average 3D scan, the advantages are immense. What you get is the best possible alignment and registration between scans. You get the highest possible accuracy overall. You get traceability and here I should mention that customers in the airline industry, again, they repeat the laser tracker SMR measurement twice, which gives them two highly accurate 3D coordinate constellations. That's before they even begin scanning. So all in all, uh, this workflow enables us to scan massive objects with very high accuracy and very tight tolerances. So because this workflow may be a bit overwhelming for those of you who see it for the first time, this is a short summary slide on the entire subject that we just discussed, and it's structured in three logical steps, just as I presented it earlier. So first comes step one, where you use the laser tracker and you make an ultra precise measurement of the drift nests by placing those SMR targets in them. Then comes step two, where instead of the SMR targets, you put professional checkerboard targets into these same nests and then scan them with the ray. And then finally in step three, you go to uh, the right software and you align the super accurate coordinates of the SMR nests with the ray coordinates of the checkerboard targets. You set your tolerances 
and you see what accuracy or what deviation you get. Obviously, this method can also be used to check the accuracy and the calibration of your ray scanner. Now, before we move on to the next related section, I'd like to take a moment to promote our iOS and Android scanning app called the Artec Remote. I'm going to start a quick poll now to see how many of you actually use the Artec Remote app. Now, give me a second to do that. And I'm launching the poll. How often do you use Artec Remote? Four possible answers. Always, sometimes, I prefer to scan in Artec Studio. What is our tech remote? Hmm. Okay, we're slowly getting some answers coming in. Okay, I'm going to wait just a tiny bit more. Okay, one minute has passed, about half of you have voted. I'm going to share the results of the poll so that you can see them. Yeah, this is actually good. So a lot of you asked, what is our tech remote? So, the Artec Remote, is main, its main advantage is that it allows you to control the scanner via Wi-Fi from your iOS or Android devices. It's an app, obviously. Now, I know that some of you will enjoy using this app on their smartphones, but it's worth mentioning that on the screen of an iPad or a tablet, so a larger device, selecting your scanning areas will be a lot more convenient than on a smartphone. The app's main advantage is speed. You don't need to wait for the scan data to import as it is being saved directly to the micro SD card, which is inserted into the scanner. Please do be aware that when you're scanning via the app, you will not be able to check whether your targets were recognized correctly and what resolution your data actually came out at. So if you only have little experience with the scanner, always check your data before leaving the scanning site. Working with the Artec Remote app is highly recommended, and currently we are putting a lot of effort into the development of this app. We're adding features, we're streamlining it, and we're optimizing it. That concludes the section about the Remote app. Also, previously, we covered basically the coolest, most complex, and most accurate workflow possible with the laser tracker. But now let's come back down to earth and talk about normal boring race scan alignment, so targets. While the professional checkerboard targets that I showed you a minute ago are clearly the most accurate targets and the only ones that we would recommend using for metrology applications, I would also like to show you some other available options. But before I get to that, let's briefly talk about why we even need targets and what advantages they bring us. So when you're making a single ray scan, which you don't need to align with any other scans, generally there's no need for targets. But when you're making multiple ray scans and then aligning those together, having targets in, the, in your scans may be very beneficial for both enhanced accuracy and shortened post-processing time. The alignment of multiple ray scans can be done using the best fit or align by geometry method without any targets at all. But depending on the scanned object, the accuracy of such an alignment may not be optimal. And geometrical alignment requires computing power and time. If on the other hand, you use targets in your scans, the alignment will be instantaneous, as you can see on the slide at the bottom. And due to the target pairs being used for aligning together the scans, this alignment will be highly accurate. Or actually, to be more precise, it will only be as accurate as the quality of the targets you're using. So in terms of targets, here are the available options. 
they're presented to you as a sort of targets hierarchy chart. As you can see, the targets are listed in decreasing order of accuracy. So most accurate at the top, least accurate at the bottom. The professional checkerboard or contrast targets that we saw in the laser tracker section earlier, those doubtlessly top the list. They are the most accurate. They're then followed by professional spherical targets, which can also be used in our tech studio. The accuracy of these spherical targets depends on the quality, the roundness, and the coating of the sphere. The list is then continued by checkerboard targets printed on standard printer paper, which shows you that not all checkerboard targets are equally precise. And then finally, the least accurate targets of all, those are the low quality, inexpensive spherical targets that you see at the bottom of the list. Now looking at this chart, I can only recommend the following. You either invest in high quality targets or you don't bother with targets at all. Because the global registration by geometry, that algorithm in Artex Studio, is a robust tool, which in many cases, especially at close to medium range, will give you a better registration accuracy than cheap, low quality targets. Returning to paper targets for a moment, the laser spot that the scanner projects is actually partially absorbed by the paper. And depending on the incidence angle of the beam, that absorption varies, as does the accuracy. Now, printing the targets on matte photo paper will give you a somewhat better result, but this is still not really recommended for metrology applications. In this slide, let's focus on spheres for a moment. Artex Studio does allow you to set a custom sphere diameter, and this enables you to work with a wide range of scanning spheres. The professional, perfectly round spheres with a special coating that you see on the left of the slide, those give you decent accuracy. And while given the right diameter setting, Artex Studio would even recognize a Christmas tree decoration as a sphere. And this, is, this isn't even a joke, by the way, I've seen this happen. But obviously we don't recommend this uh, and we don't recommend any cheap, low-quality spheres for that matter. Spheres do have a small advantage over checkerboard targets. Checkerboard targets can be recognized only up to a certain laser spot incidence angle, so between about 90 and 45 degrees, sometimes even up to 20 degrees, but that's at close distances and still not particularly recommended. Now, spheres they have virtually no limits in this regard, and they can be recognized from almost any angle, which makes their placement substantially easier. Returning to checkerboard targets, these can be scaled in size for better recognition at larger distances. So for distances beyond 15 meters, you could use A3 or A2 size targets to ensure that they are recognized correctly by the software. And when you're scanning at distances of beyond 50 meters, it may be necessary to use targets of up to A0 in size. And that's 84 by 119 centimeters. That is a massive target. It should go without saying that any targets, flat or spherical, should be affixed in a way that they stay absolutely immobile during scanning. They should not be shaking in the wind. They should not be attached to a swaying road sign, nothing of the like. Then, regardless of which targets you're using, their placement or their distribu distribution in space matters a lot. The targets need to be placed randomly at different heights and never in an orderly line. Keep in mind that these targets will be used to line together multiple scans. By placing them in a line or all at the same heights, you leave a lot of freedom for unintended drift between your scans simply due to the alignment target pairs not being unique enough or far enough apart. Okay, we are now moving on to a new subject. I hope you're still with us. Let's discuss um, using the scanner in non-horizontal position. So most frequently, the ray scanner is used in the horizontal position, sitting upon a tripod or maybe placed on top of a flat horizontal surface. Generally, this is the best and easiest way to go about. 
And uh, the built-in tilt sensor can optionally help straightening out the horizon or the z-axis if you want. Uh, but it's good to know that the ray scanner can also be used in a non-horizontal or tilted position and even upside down. So each of new ray scanner ships with uh, a default calibration file, which gives you the best accuracy when the scanner is positioned horizontally. Uh, if you know in advance that your customer wishes to regularly use the scanner position differently, upside down, for example, or tilted at a 45 degree angle, don't forget to include this information with your scanner order. Uh, the scanner will then be factory calibrated in each of the different positions. And these alternative calibrations do come at an additional cost though, as they require supplemental factory calibration steps. Uh, with the scanner being calibrated at least once in each of the desired position. Now, with these custom calibration files, the scanner will be just as accurate uh, in the alternative positions as it, as it is in the classical, classic horizontal position. And the customer will just need to choose uh, the corresponding calibration file before uh, they begin their scanning session. Uh, here's an example of, uh, yeah, in this picture, you can see how the ray scanner can be mounted upside down on a special tripod. And the point of this setup was to scan a silo by lowering the scanner in through uh, the top hatch. Here's another crucial piece of knowledge, this time about scanner balance. So the ray scanner is balanced correctly only when its battery is inserted. If the battery is missing, the weight distribution in the scanner is uneven, uh, and this can lead to serious issues in the 3D data, especially if the scanner is not positioned horizontally. Uh, therefore, even if you're scanning with the power supply connected, please make sure to always have the battery inserted for the sake of correct weight distribution. Uh, now, let's get back to the tilt correction that I briefly mentioned earlier. Um, what the tilt correction does is uh, it fine adjusts the z-axis of the 3D data in case the scanner is placed in a slightly tilted position up to 10 degrees maximum. Uh, the tilt correction is turned off by default but can be enabled in Arctic Studio. Um, on a short note though, currently the tilt correction only does its job if the texture checkbox uh, is also enabled. So this is not intended behavior and we will fix it at some point. Um, the global registration and align functions may currently also affect the, the Z axis. So when you are aligning or registering multiple scans together, be it by geometry best fit or by targets, these scans may be slightly shifted off of their original Z axis position. Um, we, we do have an update in the works that will soon allow you to lock the z-axis position, so that issue will be eliminated. Since we are focusing on engineering applications of the ray scanner, I'd like to stress the importance of a reliable he <coughs> heavy-duty tripod. A uh, proper tripod will eliminate most stability and vibration issues, which is exactly what we need when dealing with metrology and inspection applications. Uh, in our Artec support center, there is an article about tripods, uh, which links to the most recommended models. But in case you have something different in mind, we strongly advise you to consider professional industrial tripods only. So the models that can sturdily handle the five kilogram heavy 3D scanner. Um, what I'm trying to say here is Wobbly, cheap digital camera tripods will do no good here. Um, you know, at times, a certain area of the object cannot be reached properly uh, with the ray installed on a tripod, or maybe you physically cannot take the tripod to a demo. Uh, in cases like this, we recommend using sturdy mini tripods. This one right here is a Manfrotto heavy duty mini tripod, which has some uh, rubber padded feet, which helps a lot. I'd like to say that it is a lot better to use one of these than putting your scanner on top of a table or floor or such. 
Uh, it is possible to position your scanner on top of any flat surface, but please keep in mind that the field of view might be more limited due to the surface being an obstruction for the lower position of the scanning area. And uh, most importantly here, in order to prevent potential accuracy and reconstruction issues that could be caused by the scanner just skidding around on the table and vibrating, we recommend putting an anti-skid or anti-vibration mat under the scanner when scanning without a tripod. So ideally a rubber or silicon anti-vibration mat should be used, but in case there just isn't one at your disposal, using a glass drying mat would still be better than having the scanner skid around on the tabletop during scanning. Okay, I'm gonna take over from here. The next section is going to be all about texture, about having color in your 3D data and being able to visualize and export that color. I should mention that not everyone needs texture and some metrology customers don't even bother taking the lens caps off of their ray scanner, as we saw in the mining bucket picture earlier on. Now here's that picture again. I wonder how many of you actually noticed this. So the lens caps are still on the cameras. At this stage, we are going to do our third and last poll about texture. I'm going to launch it now. The question is, how often do you require texture when scanning with the ray? For all my projects, for some of my projects, or never? So let me give you roughly a minute to answer this. Okay, we're getting quite a lot of answers here. That is good. Okay, so one minute has passed. About half of you have voted. I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. There we go. You should be seeing them on screen right now. Um, most of you use the texture for some of your projects, which I think is pretty logical. Good. Let's continue. So for certain customers, texture is indeed a crucial component to their scanning workflow. And this is why you should be aware of all the options that the Ray Scanner has to offer in terms of texture. Now, speaking of built-in texture capabilities, the Ray Scanner is equipped with two 5 megapixel color cameras. These may deliver decent to acceptable texture at distances of roughly up to 15 meters, but generally don't expect to have a truly usable texture at much larger distances. In order to capture texture to begin with, make sure to enable that texture checkbox before you begin scanning. The scanner will then start by taking a bunch of pictures of the area that you have selected for scanning and will then proceed to the actual 3D data collection with the laser spot. It's important to remember that enabling the texture will currently result in longer import times of the scan data once the scan concludes. We'll definitely discuss the subject in more detail later on in the webinar. We'll come back to this. Now, once the scan import concludes and the scan shows up in our tech studio, you will see the scan in color. At this step, you may choose to export it as a colored point cloud in the XYZ RGB format. This is if you intend to post-process it in external software, for example. Or otherwise, you may choose to continue working in our tech studio. In some cases, the texture may be helpful for easier scan navigation and for manual scan alignment, as it will visually aid you in recognizing various matching elements on the scans. These could be signs, they could be markings, or they could even be pipes of different colors on a factory floor. Now, while applying ray texture to fusions is currently not an option, 
it is possible to take the texture one step further. Now this can be done by using the ray scan triangulation tool with the color mode set to source color in RTX Studio 14 or vertex color in RTX Studio 15, as you can see here. This will result in textured meshes, which are then exportable in the .plyf file format with vertex color. Exporting the mesh in the OBJ file format with an external UV map is currently not possible, unfortunately. Now, sometimes when you're scanning outdoors in very bright conditions, so I'm thinking of Australia, California, Middle East, the bright sunlight may cause the texture to be overexposed. So currently, this can actually be fixed by tweaking a value in the Artex Studio config. That's a 10 second operation and our technical support will be glad to share it with you in case you need it. And then in upcoming Artex Studio updates, uh, this exposure just functionality will actually be accessible straight from the interface, which will make it even more convenient to adjust the cameras for a sunny or bright environment. Now, this device is an external panoramic camera module and it can be used in conjunction with the ray scanner. It's actually used after the ray scanner has done its job by setting it up on the same tripod in the same position as the scanner. So what this device does is it captures beautiful high resolution texture pictures which can then be overlaid onto the ray point cloud. I should immediately note that this is a brand new workflow that we are exploring. So by this, I mean that it currently requires external non rtex software in order to apply those high resolution color images to the point cloud. But still, I didn't want to withhold this exciting new information from you because I know that some customers need good texture and they will be glad to get it in any form available. Our partners Limes from Germany were so kind as to provide some pictures of point clouds textured with this new device. If you've used the ray, you can definitely see here that the colors are impressive. And by the way, I would like to give a very special thanks to our partners Limes from Germany and to Direct Dimensions, our gold certified partner from the United States for helping out and contributing a lot of valuable content and information to this webinar. Guys, a big thank you. And that concludes my section. Right, and then we are moving on to the next segment, which is combined scanning. Uh, sometimes we find ourselves in a position where we want to have an exceptionally detailed resolution in certain areas of the scan. Uh, it also occurs that we need to scan a difficult to reach zone of an object and are unable to access this area with the ray. In cases like these, we resort to the practice of combining data from several different scanners. Uh, data captured with the ray can be easily aligned, registered, and fused together with EVA, LEO, and Space Spider data. Uh, there's only one essential limitation to consider. Due to the former differences, the raw data from the ray must be either fused or triangulated before becoming eligible for a combination with, our, with other data sets. So this leaves us with two possible scenarios, each of which has its pros and cons. Um, and the first scenario offers us the following workflow. So first we collect several raw data sets from different scanners in a single project. Then we align, register and triangulate or fuse the ray scans, thereby getting our core model that will be used as a reference for alignment of the rest of our data. At this step, we have two options. We can either align and register the raw EVA, LEO, space spider scans separately, and then having locked these scans, align and register them with the ray fusion. Or we can align them to the ray fusion one by one, and then run a global registration with all of these scans being unlocked. Having done that, we are ready to fuse everything together. Uh, but there are a few interesting moments that are worth mentioning here. So first off, it is very important to always use the right preset. Uh, presets control a lot of internal parameters of the algorithms. 
Therefore, it is crucial to use the ray preset when processing a, a data set that was captured with the ray. And the same applies to any other um, scanner that we used for that project. Uh, when it comes to processing the mixed data, data set, so I'm talking about the final global, re global registration and the final fusion, we shouldn't use the preset of the scanner that captured the most surface, like we would usually do when combining data from, let's say, EVA and SpaceBiter. But we rather must choose the preset of the handheld scanner that was used in the project, so not the ray. As for the resolution uh, of the final fusion, uh, I suggest striking a perfect balance between the resolution that was used for uh, the ray fusion and the resolution that you want to get in the high resolution area that were scanned with a handheld scanner, but with a slight inclination towards the latter. Uh, the resolution of the final fusion uh, is something that is worth experimenting with. Uh, I would suggest creating a couple of fusions with different resolution numbers and then figuring out which one works best for that particular project. Um, the biggest disadvantage of the aforementioned scenario is that you need to put everything together in just one Art of Studio project, which will inevitably put a lot of strain on your computer hardware. And because of this, the first method might not be a good choice if you're dealing with a fairly large project, but only have a slow, mediocre computer at your disposal. And this brings us to uh, the second scenario, which revolves around combining two fusions together. Uh, so we process the data from different scanners separately and then import fusions into one project and combine them there. Uh, and this is exactly what we did with this project right here that you can see on, on the screen. Uh, we scanned the fragment of this church in Luxembourg uh, with the ray scanner and then added some higher detail scans of the monument in front of it. And these were captured with the Leo. Processing this project, the first thing we did was aligning and registering the ray scans together. Then we cleaned, uh, cleaned up some of the unnecessary data and combined the scans into a single fusion. Having done that, we switched to the Leo project and went through all post-processing stages there as well, getting a high resolution fusion as a result. And uh, the last thing we did was combining these two fusions together in a separate project. For this, we imported them both into a new empty project. We run the alignment and global registration and then perform the sharp fusion using the Leo preset with a resolution number of two. Um, on a side note, uh, there is an ongoing discussion about whether uh, it is better to delete the overlapping data from the ray fusion. I personally am inclined to say that indeed it is better to delete the overlapping data and thus avoiding the risk of uh, the lower resolution data merging with the higher resolution data. But we know for a fact that some users can get perfectly satisfactory results despite neglecting to delete this overlap. Um, yeah, let me show you another combined project that we scanned in the very heart of Luxembourg city. This is a statue of Michel Rodange, a prominent Luxembourgish writer. Um, the main character of his most popular book was a fox which you can see at the very top of the composition. As you can also see, it is a multi-level sculpture that cannot be easily scanned with the Leo or the Evo in its entirety. So we use both the Ray and the Leo scanner. And uh, yeah, this is the, the result that we got. Uh, and in case you forgot about the project that we started the webinar with, uh, it was executed with the help of two scanners as well. So it is a combined project indeed. Right, now let's move on to the next topic, which is import. So uh, when talking about the ray scanner, a concern that often pops up is the data import and conversion speed. Um, we are aware of this and our software developers are already on it. And here's the issue, depending on certain factors, the conversion and input speed of uh, ray data into RX Studio might be unreasonably slow. Um, a crucial piece of knowledge here is that the texture mapping process plays a very significant role here. What we as users can do to address this issue at the time being is to decide whether 
we really need to tick that texture capture and checkbox. So what I mean is when we don't plan on using texture during at the workflow, uh, we should probably decide against capturing it in the first place and thereby considerably boosting the conversion speed. But let's say texture is needed. Um, in this case, we can consider decreasing the scanning zones width uh, when selecting them on the preview. Maybe that full 360 scan isn't really necessary and we can limit the data capture to a number of smaller zones instead. Meanwhile, our software developers are actively working on speeding up the import process and uh, a new import algorithm with better CPU uh, core usage is already in the works. Um, as my colleagues announced a few weeks ago, Arctic Studio 15 will be capable of importing several ray scans simultaneously. So when you do that in Arctic Studio 14, the scans are processed one by one in a queue and Arctic Studio 15 will be able to process them simultaneously, which means that uh, the import of multiple files will be faster up to 50%. Right. So the webinar is now coming to a close. Uh, for those of you who have any additional questions regarding the race scanner, we are about to start the Q&A session. Uh, and also we have recently published an Artec Ray FAQ article in the Artec Support Center. We did our best to fit in as much useful information into this article as possible. So please go have a look. Right, and now we are ready to answer any of your questions. Okay, let me have a look. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Julia, our tech sales team. Um, before we move on to the Q&A session, I just wanted to grab uh, one minute of your attention and uh, make a very short announcement. Um, well, we decided to extend... Uh, can someone please assist me and show the... Yeah show the announcement on the screen. Uh, we decided to extend our special offer. So for anyone who's interested in getting Ray demo unit, um, especially after such an amazing webinar, thank you guys. Um, please do that uh, in May. Uh, this way you can prepay 50% uh, and uh, then the second payment can be done, uh, can be made uh, within the next half a year, so six months. Um, by this uh, little initiative, uh, we really try to support you. Uh, those of you who are uh, willing to get started with this uh, amazing project. Um, so if anyone is interested, please contact your account managers to discuss that further. Thank you. And yeah, we're waiting for your questions now. Thank you. Okay, so I have scrolled back a little bit in the chat here. And I think the first question that I'm able to find is from Bo. Uh, who is asking, can you provide recommended sources for high quality checkerboard and sphere targets? Uh, now, I do not have a link at hand to provide, uh, but if you email us, so I recommend you email uh, sales and support simultaneously, we'll definitely provide um, some checkerboard and sphere target recommendations. Then next from Marcio. Is Artec planning to have a tracker device? Uh, no, we are not planning on, on making a laser tracker because there are enough uh, laser tracker devices out there. Um, the Ray works perfectly with pretty much any laser tracker, so there's no need. Okay, and then some comments about uh, the sun and the brightness adjust. Not a problem in Denmark. <laughs> How long does it take to scan the building with the parking stand from the presentation? Oh, I think I know what you mean. Yes, so that building is actually the Artec office, uh, Artec headquarters in Luxembourg. So it took, I think, roughly two hours to scan around the whole building. 
but I must mention that we were using, uh, so part of the scans were made at maximum resolution, the highest possible. Part of the scans were made at medium resolution. So it's, it did take quite some time. And next from Edison Grants, Okay, so laptop requirements to be able to scan with the ray scanner. Um, it is best if uh, we send you a link to the Artex Support Center, or you can Google um, Artex Support Center, and there we have a special article which has all the requirements for the ray scanner. So, for example, 32 gigabytes of RAM would be the absolute, like, minimum recommendation, and that would still depend on um, what size objects you're scanning. Okay, and Jeff Trey. Are data hemispheres merged differently when using the iPad app compared to when connected by USB? We do not have overlapping data when using the iPad app. Uh, so, in theory, there should not be a difference how the two hemispheres are merged, but the question is, in Artex Studio, when you continue working with the data, there is indeed a setting that allows you to seamlessly merge the hemispheres. Um, but that would also be available after importing the data. Now, it's best if you send us that data set to support at artex3d.com, and we'll take a look. So, just... Um, yeah, it's best if you send the full data set with a, maybe a short screenshot. Okay, which computer is necessary for works this big data for one building? Uh-huh, so uh, Marco, I assume you are asking which, like how powerful the computer was where we processed the data of the Artec building. Uh, so actually, I was able to mostly process this, um, by process I mean like a line and global register, etc. This data on uh, my laptop, which is an i7 with 64 gigabytes of RAM. Now the 64 gigabytes of RAM were barely enough, so if you're really planning on scanning buildings like that, um, I may recommend more. Right, obviously depending on how you're processing the data, etc, etc. I have a Microsoft Surface, Marcio Adami. Uh, is there a way to use the mobile app for Ray on the Microsoft Surface? Unfortunately not. So the app is only compatible with um, iOS, so that's iPhone, iPad, or Android devices. The Microsoft Surface is running the full version of Windows, uh, which means the only thing that you can run on there is Artex Studio, if, of course, the hardware is powerful enough to uh, support it. What environment temperature range for Ray? Um, I don't remember it by heart 100%, so it's best if you look it up in the Artex Support Center. Um, approximately something between 10 and 30, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's best to look in it's the Artex Support Center. from 5 uh, oh, to 40. You. Yeah, five. it's within the range of from 5 to 40. Thank you for looking it up. Uh, did you get further with texture infusions made from multiple ray scans? Fusion from multiple... Okay, so I think we have multiple questions here from Simon Klintzberg. Did you get further with texture infusions made from multiple ray scans? Oh, okay, I got the question. Uh, unfortunately, that is not yet possible. So if you take multiple ray scans, and you make them into one fusion, uh, there is currently no option to texture that. So the only way to have the texture on a model is to use the ray scan triangulation. And then you mentioned that the ray can run upside down with the proper calibration. Can this be done with 90 degrees rotation as well? So you mean, can the ray be used sideways? So not upside down, but 90 degrees sideways. The answer to that is a yes, it can. Uh, you definitely need to have the battery in there for correct balance, and you will definitely need that custom calibration as it was mentioned in the webinar. Can you share the spec of your laptop? Maybe support can add this to recommended laptops. It's probably already in there. Um, I can actually even tell you the spec right now. It's standing right next to me. So it's an Intel Core i7, 8750H, 2.2 gigahertz, 
was 64 gigs of RAM. That's the most important specs, Patrick. And you know, you can, you can also email me. I'll, I'll share any additional information that may be required. Are there plans, so Alexander Chung, are there plans to upgrade the mobile app so that you can view the scans or at least as thumbnails to confirm the scan has finished? Uh, I'll take this as a feature request. So I'm not aware of such plans currently, uh, but I may have missed something. Anyways, I'll take that as a feature request right there. So I'll forward that to our development team. Where can I see the cases with Ray? Alexander Shostakov. Um, you mean the use cases that were shown in the very beginning of the webinar, I assume? If that's what you mean, uh, one of them is about to be published on the website, uh, the one where they reverse engineer the giant pipe. Um, the other use case that we mentioned, um, I'm not sure it may be confidential. So that was actually something our Australian reseller shared with us. So not sure on that one. Then a question from Ian Sayers. Are there plans to make a PC version of the app that can connect via Wi-Fi and does not require USB connection? Uh, once again, I'll take that as a feature request. So as far as I'm aware, uh, no plans of that type as of yet, but I'll forward it to our developers. Next question, Alexei Bokin, to optimize the resulting model obtained from scans from different devices that previously proposed to have the ability to select parts with different resolutions for fusions on the point cloud. I do understand that this is not so clear how to do that, but one way to make this is to make several fusions with different resolution on selected surfaces in the background and then close the holes. <laughs> Anton, would you maybe like to answer this one? This goes more in the direction of combined scanning, and I'm not sure I 100% understand it. Yeah, let me read it once again. <clears throat> so to optimize the resulting model obtained from scans from different devices, I previously proposed and the ability to select parts with different resolutions for fusions on the point cloud. Yeah, I do understand that this is not so clear how to do that, but one way to make this to make several fusions with different resolutions. Uh, and run them those holes small. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. And this is actually one of the requests that some of our team members have made for the further versions of RX Studio. So this is one of the features which I believe our engineers are working on at the moment. And that'd be great. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, the scanners have to be calibrated regularly. How can I tell a calibration is necessary? I can answer that if you want. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I can think of two methods. Uh, one would be you could check the scanner with a laser tracker, exactly as we discussed on uh, in the webinar. Another method would be much simpler. Um, you could get a uh, an object with a metrology object, preferably with a predefined known length, and then you scan that object with the Artec ray at different distances, and then you export that into measuring software and you just measure if you, if you got any deviation from the size that that object is supposed to be. So that would be already two methods of checking how, um, how well your scanner is calibrated. <clears throat> oh yeah, and by the way, this is the link that uh, Evgenia has shared. So we are kind of curious about the topics that are of the most interest for you guys. So could you please answer that quick poll? Uh, and uh, we'll rely on your answers when we'll be thinking and planning our, our next webinars and next events. So thank you very much. Are there any higher capacity batteries for Artec Ray? Also, I do find sometimes the battery drains even when idle. Vadim, could you please assist me yes. with this one? Yes, okay, I'll answer that. Um, so regarding higher capacity batteries for the Artec Ray, the general official answer is no. Uh, it's just the batteries that you get with it. Uh, 
theoretically, the Leo battery does fit into the ray, but there we get into the subject of the balance of the scanner. So if the scanner is like perfectly, perfectly level, you do some tests um, and you're fine running with the uh, Leo battery, that may be an option for when you need to do some extended scanning. And then I do sometimes find that the battery drains even when idle. Yes, that's unfortunately by design. Uh, so as soon as you're done scanning, just pull that battery out of the scanner completely. That's the only way to prevent it from draining. And a question from Jeff Trey, can we use Surf Express with the Artec Ray? Yes, you can, it works. Do you propose a tripod for the Ray? Yeah, we do. We have an article on the Artec website. Actually, let me find it real quick. I'm going to link you the article. Um, so I just uh, posted the general link to the Artec Support Center because I've mm -hmm. already referred multiple times to it. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of valuable information in there. So just use that search bar and whatever it is that you're looking for, you'll most likely be able to find it by keywords. How yeah, but I... that, here's the link just in case. Yeah, that's the exact link to accessories for Artec Ray and that also has the tripod. Now from Jeff Trey, how can I use Surf Express? Well, basically in the exact same way that you would use it with a Surfacer scanner. There's, there's no difference. It works exactly the same. You, um, I guess the only uh, thing that you'd have to do is you'd have to pull out the RPR file um, from Artec Studio's app data directory, or you can take, yeah, that's, that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah, so you just pull out the RPR file from Artec Studio's uh, app data directory and you feed that to Surf Express, and then you use it in the standard way as you would use it with Surfacer. Thanks from Portland. That is good. Okay, looks like we haven't got any more questions. Uh, but look, in case you will have any questions related to this webinar or any other Arctic related topics, feel free to send us an email, uh, our support team, our sales team. Uh, yeah, we'll be happy to answer any question that you might have. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank all of you for attending the webinar. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you in a week during our other event. We're hosting one a week on Thursday, so please come by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys, for a very comprehensive webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Marco.